Enoch Powell. Mr Deputy Speaker, in the last Parliament, there was only one debate on the subject which we increasingly miscall immigration. Uh, even that debate occurred accidentally as the result of a success in the ballot of the Honourable Member uh, for Thanet. And I remember during the course of that Parliament, there were from this side of the House increasing and repeated demands that the subject should be further ventilated upon the floor of the House, to which the Labour Party, then in office, responded that this would be a very suitable topic for a supply day. <coughs> and I uh, recognise the fact that uh, in opposition uh, they have been uh, true to their professions and have very properly and rightly uh, provided a longer time for the discussion not merely of the detail but of the bearings of the document which is before the House. Uh, sir, we are only in four debating immigration in the literal sense of the term. If all it was about was literally immigration, then we should not for year upon year be tearing ourselves to pieces about the details of the rules which are to be followed by the immigration officers, nor should we be studying the small print, uh, nor would there be the excited, almost feverish interest uh, in so very relatively small a practical effect as that which will be produced by regulations such as these. Uh, this debate, these regulations, and the whole discussion of immigration in the literal sense is conditioned by something which is hardly ever mentioned in the course of these debates. The major premise of the argument remains unspoken. We debate under the presence of a cloud to the existence and presence of which hardly anyone ever draws attention. We only have these debates. We only engage in this legislation because of the present and prospective composition in a particular respect of the population of England. I use the word England accurately, indeed more accurately still, I would say, of most of the major cities and industrial areas of England. It is because of what we know about the present composition of that population and what we have reason to know about its future that we engage in feverish discussion of an extra thousand or more uh, entering or prevented from entering this country year by year. And of course, honorable members uh, on these benches who say that these rules uh, are not of universal application in intent, but are only related to a specific description of potential immigrant are quite right. Of course they're right. They are pointing to a known fact. They are related to that element in the population of England, which we all have in mind and have for many years had in mind when we have debated and legislated on immigration. It's a matter of um, much more than semantic importance. Indeed, I think it has in some ways bedeviled discussion and understanding that we have no appropriate word to describe that element in the population. We call it the immigrant population, but that is a word which is increasingly inapplicable, for increasingly that population consists of those who have not immigrated into the United Kingdom. So under that difficulty, 
we take refuge in colour and we refer to the coloured population or to the blacks. But we know perfectly well that this is unsatisfactory. We are, after all, all coloured. And coloured in that context is a mere euphemism uh, to express uh, our embarrassment and difficulty of expression. And as for the word black, I will only say that nobody who has ever served in India, or should I perhaps say served India, could ever use him, uh, could ever bring himself uh, to use that term. Well, what are we to do? We have, fortunately, some assistance from the Office of Population Censuses and Surveys. They have a term of art, at least, clumsy though it may be. Persons of New Commonwealth and Pakistan <coughs> ethnic origin. <coughs> there, there is, uh, at any rate, a definition uh, not exactly convenient, but it is a definition of that element in the population of great parts of England, which is what all this is about, its present and its future. And so, with occasional, I hope, pardonable abbreviation, uh, I will endeavour to use it uh, from now on. We do know a good deal not as much as we might, but we do know a good deal about the present and future size and relative size of that element of a population. We know that in the areas of England to which I've referred, for as far back as records have been kept, and in the case of a city of Birmingham, that is some 22 or 23 years. I think that is the longest period available for any place in the kingdom. <coughs> we know that the proportion of births to that population, to the total of births, has remained at a level of one-fifth, one-quarter, one-third. And where, over the years for which we have these figures, it has varied, it has steadily increased as a proportion of the total. <coughs> now it is no, oh, there is one point I should further add. For we know this too, about the figures for the more recent years. And that is that they are not complete. And the OPCS tells us that perfectly candidly. For they no longer include births to members of that population, both of whom were themselves born in this country. And therefore, on the definition of the OPCS itself, the new Commonwealth and pa Pakistan ethnic origin births are a larger proportion of total births than the figures which I have been mentioning. Yes, sir? I'm mean, most grateful to the Adam for the giving away. I hope he's not suggesting that this is in some way an unfair method of, uh, of making a judgment by OPCS. Surely it is perfectly right that uh, where a husband and wife were both born in this country, uh, it's not, uh, it, we're not talking about uh, immigrants. Well, so surely the right honourable gentleman would agree that OPCS has been doing its job quite properly. Yes, uh, I, I thought that was clear. Yeah. I thought it was uh, clear that I had accepted their definition of a population which we are all trying to talk about, but for which we have no appropriate single or simple terminology. And I was simply drawing attention to the fact that the OPCS itself points out that the proportions to which I have referred have in recent years increasingly understated the proportion of births which are births to the new Commonwealth and Pakistan ethnic population. Now this further, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we know in consequence. We know it not as a conjecture. We know it not as an extrapolation. We know it not as a theory, but we know it as a fact that those proportions are the pattern of the future total population of those parts of the country. Well, Subject to very minor 
qualifications, such as further literal immigration, it's changing now. Uh, and subject to internal migration, subject to that, there is no escape from the fact that the pattern of births over 10, 15, 20, 25 years must be the pattern of a future total population unless, Mr. Deputy Speaker, one makes uh, assumptions which I have in fact never made in this context, namely... What does this have to do with the proposed changes in the immigration rules we're debating tonight? Mm. On that point of order, I think it's sufficiently material to what we are debating. It's a general debate on emigration, on immigration. Well, I think, Mr. Deputy well, Speaker, point of order, Mr. Mr. Deputy. that's point of order. The order paper is quite clear. Today is not a general debate on immigration. It's a debate specifically aimed at the statement on immigration rules and the proposed changes in the immigration rules. And it really is not a general debate on immigration. Well, I've, I've noted what the Honourable Gentleman says. I think what the, hon the Right Honourable Gentleman has been saying is perfectly in order with what the debate is all about. Are you not, pal? I'm much obliged, Mr Deputy Speaker, and before I conclude, I hope to show the Honourable Member and others that what I am talking about is very relevant indeed to the fact that the House has before it these particular rules and this particular document. I was saying, Mr Deputy Speaker, that we know, because it is the result of facts which already exist, the minimum proportion in future which that population will represent to the whole over the areas of this country which are concerned. We know, therefore, that in central London it will be one third or more and we know that there will be a similar ratio in many of the other great cities of England. Now, in those circumstances, to imagine that one can say that by this, these rules or any others, one can bring, in the Conservative Party's terminology of which the Honourable Member for Wolverhampton South West reminded the House, can bring a clear end to immigration, is totally absurd. For if there is a settled population, this settled population of this magnitude, it is idle to imagine that its recruitment will not continue. I use recruitment as an entirely, I intended it so, as an entirely neutral word. Unless we are to say to a res part of a resident population of this country, you shall not marry whence you please, you may not choose or find spouses where you think fit. I understand that. That's the, the Honourable Member is assisting me and the Deputy Speaker uh, to, uh, to uh, fix the relevance of my remarks to the subject of a debate. It is absurd to contend that you can bring an end to immigration when that is to be the pattern of our future population. By the very natural order of things, such a population, it may be to a varying extent as to the varying parts of it, but taking it as a whole, such a population is bound to involve, and I almost said to require, a continuing immigration. And therefore, the attempt to deal with the anxieties of great numbers in our cities, the attempt to deal with the fears or feelings or whatever it was to which the Right Honourable Lady the Prime Minister was referring, by adjustments of the detailed uh, requirements for immigration, is not merely futile. It is either deception or it is, more charitably, self-deception. But whether it is self-deception or deception, the effect is to promote and keep alive in people's minds uh, a kind of escape route from the future which lies before this country. To enable people in large numbers, and all honourable members know what I'm saying, to say to themselves, 
Oh, if only immigration was stopped, this would go away. If only they would control immigration. It is a delusion which we merely feed and support by pretending that by controlling immigration, by tinkering with, by rendering rational, in the words of a parliamentary undersecretary of state, the immigration rules, we can appreciably alter that which, on the facts as they are, lies before this country. The Honourable Member wishes to interrupt. I'm obliged to the right honourable gentleman. Isn't the fallacy of his argument that when this population stabilises at 3.3 million, there really won't be, there really won't be any substantial danger such as he has argued for in the past? Because these people will be British, and though they will be of Asian or West Indian origin in, 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 in their ethnic origin, they will be British in their outlook, and the kind of composition of this society will be different from the one we're in at the moment, but it will be a settled harmonious. Well, I, I, I take it to be a, a confirmation of a logical manner in which I was attempting to uh, devolve, evolve my argument uh, that the Honourable and Learned Member for York uh, anticipated the ground onto which I was about to move. But at least I'm sure he is with me and I do not see how anyone really can be against me in saying that if you have such a population, such a population settled in this country, uh, it is idle to talk of a clean end to immigration. For immigration is implicit in the existence of the cities of this country, of, a, of that population, and of those dimensions. Now I come to the question. Now I come to the question which uh, the honourable member for York posed to me, and which I say it is the duty of everyone to pose to himself, and not merely to pose to himself, but that we have a duty and responsibility to declare ourselves upon it, and to say what we believe would be meant by an inner London, one-third New Commonwealth and, F and Pakistan ethnic, a Leicester, a Birmingham, a Wolverhampton, a West Riding of similar dimensions. Now, broadly speaking, Mr. Deputy Speaker, there are three schools of thought on this subject. They vary in shades, but they can be perhaps usefully classified in this way. There are those who say, if I may use a jocular expression, it'll be all right on the night. That uh, it will evolve naturally, harmoniously, and I think that is the party, as it were, to which the Honourable and Learned Member for York belongs. Absolutely. We shall grow up with it, it will grow up with us, and we need not therefore bother our heads about it. Least of all need we attempt to bring to bear irrelevancies of irritant detail such as those which are before the House this evening. That is one point of view. There is a second point of view which, uh, however much over the years I have sought to persuade myself that it was ill-founded, I must nevertheless admit to holding. It is that such an England would be unlivable and ungovernable. That it would not be inconceivable to us because of our past habits, but it would be inconceivable in reality, and that its inconceivability would dissolve in civil discord and violence. That is another point of view which many hold, and there is a third which is, in a sense, akin to it. And that is the view, uh, and I use the word for convenience only, of the race relations industry. Now, the race relations industry belongs to school two and not school one. They are school two B. They say, yes, indeed, there is such a catastrophe ahead, but it can be averted by race relations legislation administration, persuasion, and all the rest of it. Whichever of those is right, we do not know. This is a matter which cannot be decided by any deduction, logic, analogy from elsewhere, 
for such an England would be unique and unprecedented in the relevant terms, which are the terms of England. But we, no I won't, no, no I've given away to the honourable member once and I want to complete my speech, I'm sorry. Uh, we nevertheless have the duty now, because we are responsible for that future, as we in the past have been responsible for that future. We have a duty to decide and to declare and to persuade our fellow countrymen, if we can, that we are right in what we say as to those, as to those consequences. Yes? Could I ask the Right Honourable General, I've been listening very carefully to what he said. I should explain to the Right Honourable General, I happen to have black relatives and I do not take kindly to the sort of statements that are now being made by the Right Honourable Gentleman. But apart from that, what's the logic of his argument? Where is he leading us to? He's explained quite rightly that we are now a multiracial society, that we also have to have some control of immigration, whether it's white or black. That's all accepted. I don't think anybody now argues in this house that you can have unlimited immigration. But having accepted that, what is the logic of his argument? Where is it leading us to? What is he proposing? Is he suggesting, is he suggesting that we send all the coloured people, where do we send them back to? What is the logic of his argument? Well, well, evidently the question is, wasn't it worth debating then? But let me say to the honourable member for Walton that I'm extremely sorry, indeed I'm grieved, if anything which I have said could give any offence uh, to him or indeed to any other person of whatever... The, on, the, the, honourable, the, the Honourable Member for York says I give offence whenever I open my mouth on this subject. No. Yes, but to, to echo the Honourable Member for Walton, where does this take us to? Where are you taking it, us to? It, ta it takes us to the point at which honourable members, responsible to their constituencies, responsible for the future, may only offer one view, no other, as to what the future holds. Otherwise, they will be regarded as giving offence. Now, the importance of this and where it is leading is that according to the view which is taken, as between those broad alternatives, alternative interpretations, according to the view which on their responsibility the government take, so they must act. So they must act. And if it be the case that the prospective pattern of the population of this country is such that this country would not be a place worth living in, or a city capable, or a city capable of being governed for all who live in it, then it is the duty of those in authority, I'm going to complete the sentence, uh, or that it is the duty of those in authority to take measures accordingly. And those measures, since they are in the interest of all, are measures which ought to claim the support of all and on, for which the support of all to, ought to be sought and I believe would be forthcoming. Now what the government are doing and what the Conservative Party has done by what it has said in its election manifesto and by the way it has acted in office is to renege upon that responsibility. They have not been prepared to say to the public, this is the future of the population of England. We believe it is acceptable, we intend to maintain it. And nothing, yes, we intend to shut our eyes. And nothing that we will do, nothing that we are going to bring forward can make any practical effect to it. And by this kind of, it isn't even legislation, as the parliamentary undersecretary was careful to point out, by this kind of fiddling, they are merely finding an excuse to deny to the British people the duty which as the government they owe to them.
Harvey Proctor. Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, I'm very pleased to be following the uh, Right Honourable Member for South Down, who has spoken inside this House and outside this House on a number of occasions on this subject when politicians, both parties in this country, have felt like some honourable members tonight that he best be silent about the issue on which he speaks so well and so succinctly. He began his speech tonight by referring, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to the fact that this House very rarely debates this subject. Uh, he referred to the last full debate held on the 24th of May 1976 uh, when immigration and indeed emigration uh, were discussed. I think it's a pity that we do not uh, discuss this subject at greater length. And I believe the fact that we don't debate it at further length contributes to the fear that many people we represent have come to associate with this particular issue. We are indebted to Her Majesty's uh, opposition, 